Why didn't humanity return? It's the question murmured in lecture halls, argued over online, and dissected quietly by researchers far from Cape Canaveral. Officially, the explanation is familiar, politics, shifting priorities, and tight budgets. But through the lens of Chinese scientists observing the U.S. from afar, another story takes shape, one involving eroded expertise, technical gaps, and a lunar environment more severe than we let ourselves remember. The quiet pause is an ominous. It's humbling. Because the moon doesn't offer do-overs. What NASA walked away from in 1972 wasn't just the Apollo program, it was an entire ecosystem of tools, knowledge, and manufacturing that we still haven't fully rebuilt. The mission that didn't continue December 1972 marked the last human footprint on the lunar surface. Since the crew of Apollo 17 departed, more than half a century has passed without another astronaut stepping onto the moon. The usual account is simple, national focus shifted toward low Earth orbit, the space shuttle, and later the ISS lunar hardware aged out, and the specialized equipment, landers, deep space capsules, surface suits, propulsion modules, quietly grew obsolete. But read deeper into technical commentary from outside the U.S., including analyses from China, and a different pattern emerges. Yes, budgets mattered. But so did loss of capability. The machinery that carried Apollo astronauts worked within tight margins, using hardware tailored to a particular era. When the program ended, the engineers dispersed, the factories closed, and the institutional memory slowly evaporated. Chinese researchers argue that the lack of human return isn't because the U.S. didn't want to go back, it's because the moon itself is a harsh destination. The extreme re-entry speeds, radiation levels, terrain hazards, none of these softened with time. Instead, our understanding of their severity grew sharper. So when people say funding dried up, that may be shorthand for something harder to admit, the U.S. was no longer ready. When physics pushes back, Artemis was supposed to restore that readiness. But physics had other plans. In December 2022, Artemis I completed a 25-day uncurred mission, swinging around the moon before slamming into Earth's atmosphere at nearly 40, 000 km slash h. Everything appeared successful until engineers inspected Orion's heat shield. The shield, made of an updated version of the Apollo-era ablative material Avcoat, didn't behave as expected. Instead of burning away smoothly in thin layers, it shed irregular chunks. Hot plasma forced its way into pockets, causing cracking and unpredictable erosion. This wasn't cosmetic damage. Orion had survived, but a crewed mission might not. Artemis II, initially meant to launch in 2024, was postponed first to 2025, then to April 2026. Artemis III slipped to 2027 or later. The problem was sobering. Returning from the moon isn't just Apollo with better computers. It's high-energy physics we haven't dealt with in 50 years. Even proven materials can fail in unexpected ways when tested under lunar return conditions. Radiation. The quiet barrier beyond heat lies another threat, silent and constant. Outside Earth's magnetic shield, astronauts face a relentless stream of cosmic rays, solar storms, and charged particles. Apollo crews spent at most 12 days beyond low Earth orbit. Artemis missions will last much longer. And Solar Cycle 25 is peaking in 2025, meaning more flares, more CMEs, more radiation spikes. In deep space, Spacecraft orientation becomes a matter of life or death. A few degrees can mean the difference between tolerable exposure and mission-ending doses. Chinese and European radiation experts stress that shielding isn't just about adding mass, it's about where that mass is placed and how the spacecraft responds to real-time solar activity. Crews need storm shelters inside the capsule, densest sections where they can hide during a solar event. Launch windows must align with solar forecasts. Radiation isn't dramatic, but it accumulates, and over long missions it becomes a defining constraint. The moon hasn't grown more dangerous. We've grown more aware of what danger means. Lunar dust, the ancient threat not all lunar hazards explode or flare. Some lie quietly beneath an astronaut's boots. Lunar regolith, the dust of the moon, isn't dust as we know it. It's sharp, abrasive, and electrostatically clingy. 
Because there is no atmosphere, particles are never smoothed by wind or water. Apollo astronauts reported that dust stuck to everything, scratched visors, damaged seals, clogged joints, and filled the lander with a burnt metal smell. Chinese data from the China missions confirms the danger, lunar dust can erode suits, foul habitat systems, and degrade equipment over time. And because it never dulls, every step stirs up particles that can threaten long-term operations. Dust mitigation isn't a cleanup issue. It's mission-critical engineering. Gravity oddities end. Moonquakes the moon looks inert, but its interior is restless. Beneath the surface lie mascons, dense subsurface regions that distort local gravity. NASA's GRAIL mission showed how these anomalies can tug on orbiters, alter trajectories, and complicate landings. Future missions, especially around the South Polar region, must navigate these invisible gravitational traps with extreme precision. And once on the surface, there's another challenge, moonquakes. They last far longer than earthquakes, sometimes more than 10 minutes, because the moon's crust is dry and fractured. Apollo seismometers recorded quakes strong enough to threaten structural stability. China's scientists frequently point out that the U.S. hasn't collected moonquake data since 1977. Half a century of seismic activity has gone unrecorded, leaving large gaps in our understanding just as we plan to build permanent bases. Money and the deeper costs budget cuts are the publicly cited reason Apollo ended. But Chinese aerospace analysts view it differently. They say the deeper cost was abandoning an active lunar architecture. Engineers retired, experience faded, suppliers shifted to other work, and decades of documentation were scattered or lost. When NASA began Artemis, it wasn't restarting, it was reconstructing. Everything had to be redesigned or rediscovered, suits, valves, life support systems, docking hardware. The ISS era brought innovation, but it pulled talent away from deep space operations. By the time the U.S. decided to return to the moon, the infrastructure that once made Apollo possible had vanished. How China interprets the silence Chinese engineers have closely followed Artemis delays. Their interpretation is not conspiratorial. They see the delays as a reflection of complexity, not secrecy. When timelines slip without detailed public explanation, their question is simple. What problems are being solved behind the scenes? They note that if the issues were purely financial or mechanical, schedules would recover more quickly. But when the challenge is rediscovering lost knowledge, rebuilding capability from scratch, time becomes the only real solution. China's own lunar program emphasizes incremental testing, transparent failures, and methodical progress. Through that lens, they view the U.S. pause not as hesitation, but as recognition of the moon's uncompromising physics. Progress may feel slow, but it has installed. From an outside vantage point, the Artemis schedule slips look logical, especially if the U.S. is juggling complicated problems that can't easily be captured in press statements, particularly when astronaut safety and agency credibility are on the line. So when Chinese researchers say they aren't telling you everything, it isn't a wink toward conspiracy theories. It's a technical shorthand for a recurring pattern, engineering complications that only surface after delays accumulate. That external perspective can be valuable. Sometimes the clearest understanding of a program's difficulties comes from those who must analyze it from afar. And those problems aren't just in the brand new tech. They also live in what the U.S. let slip away. The moon hasn't changed since Apollo, but our engineering ecosystem has. After the final Apollo mission in 1972, the United States dismantled nearly all of the hardware and industrial infrastructure that enabled human lunar travel. Saturn V tooling was destroyed. Lunar module designs were tucked into archives. The last moon-capable spacesuit was stored and forgotten. For decades, little effort was made to preserve or update the knowledge base behind them. The result was a quiet erosion of mission-critical expertise. When NASA revived a plan for returning astronauts to the moon in the 2010s, it became obvious that the challenge wasn't simply building new spacecraft, it was rebuilding an entire capability the nation had allowed to atrophy. Skills needed for lunar landers, deep space life support, heat shielding, and radiation protection had migrated to unrelated industries or disappeared entirely. 
Even finding companies still capable of producing Apollo-grade avionics parts required years of searching, certification, and redevelopment. Chinese engineers, many working on the Long March 10th and the International Lunar Research Station, ILRS, often emphasize that resurrecting old technology is harder than inventing new. Legacy designs come with obsolete materials, missing documentation, and outdated assumptions. Updating them is less like starting fresh and more like renovating a structure whose blueprints no longer exist. In that sense, the Artemis schedule is not just ambitious, it's archaeological. Engineers are exhuming capabilities from a different technological era and validating them all over again. That long reconstruction effort is part of why Artemis III remains grounded. SLS, Orion, the new lunar suits, and the lander all rely on either revived or entirely rebuilt manufacturing pipelines. And, when one part falters, like the Orion heat shield problems found in 2022, the whole chain must stop. This isn't stagnation. It's recalibration. And it reminds us that returning to the moon isn't simply repeating the 1969 mission profile. It's reinventing methods we assumed were already solved. So why is it taking so long? Because the delays aren't just bureaucratic. They're rooted in physical reality. The obstacles of modern lunar missions aren't merely logistical. They're fundamental system-level risks that only reveal themselves when equipment is tested at full scale. Artemis I showed this plainly, even one anomaly, like the unexpected chunks of heat shield material coming off during re-entry, can overturn years of planning. To its credit, NASA has been transparent. Reports released in 2023 and 2024 explain the heat shield failures on Artemis I and the redesigns underway for Artemis II. But those documents also underline a harsh truth. We underestimated what a sustainable presence on the moon actually requires. The lunar environment is not just distant, it's entirely different. New models for radiation, lunar dust behavior, and reentry dynamics all need to be recalculated from scratch. Chinese commentary, especially from teams working on Chang E7, frequently notes that Apollo era risk assumptions don't apply anymore. Our missions will be longer crews larger, hardware reusable, and systems more interconnected. Every layer introduces new unknowns. From minor software issues to unpredictable gravitational quirks, every subsystem becomes a potential delay, not because teams are incompetent, but because the problem is inherently complex. So when people ask, why haven't we gone back? The honest answer may be, because we now understand the true difficulty of doing so safely and sustainably. And that understanding demands responsibility. A delay is not failure, it's a recalibration of goals to match reality. Which leads to a final point, the moon demands respect. What Chinese researchers want the world to recognize within China's scientific community, a consistent idea surfaces, returning to the moon isn't about proving we can repeat Apollo. It's about figuring out how not to lose what we discover this time. Their message, quiet but steady, is one of humility, openness, and cooperation. The moon is not a trophy. It's a teacher. And ignoring its lessons doesn't just cost time. It sets humanity backward. Chinese teams working on ILRS have pushed for more data sharing on lunar dust, radiation effects, material degradation, and more. They argue that the stagnation after Apollo wasn't only political. It was also scientific isolation. When agencies hold failures close, those failures eventually get repeated. Their warning is simple, the moon is not a rerun. It's a new chapter, requiring new tools, new approaches, and new forms of collaboration, even with rivals. Both the US and China are now moving toward the lunar surface, walking parallel paths through an ancient and unforgiving environment. And for those wondering why humanity waited so long, the deeper answer emerges, we had to. The moon punishes ignorance and rewards preparation. Whenever we return, 2026, 2027, or later, it will be more than another rocket launch. It will reflect years of relearning, rebuilding, and facing uncomfortable truths. It will mark a shift from flags and symbolism toward permanence, stewardship, and shared scientific purpose. Because ultimately, the moon has never been just a destination. It's a mirror, revealing our ambition, 
our limits, and our willingness to face the unknown with patience rather than pride. And when we finally go back for real, we won't just be landing. We'll be ready to stay.